Hi everybody, welcome to the Emory's Memories channel. I'm your announcer, Gary Beatty. This channel was created to feature interviews by Ralph Emory. There are over 125 interviews by Ralph for you to enjoy on this channel. This channel has also become a collection point for rare and in some cases never before seen shows and interviews. What you're about to see is one of 14 classic interviews hosted by the Lagarde Twins from Sydney, Australia. It's part of a TV series they created, and it's called Down Home, Down Under. Now, these interviews have remained in their private collection, and they've never aired on radio or television until now. Let's watch their one-on-one -on -one interview with Ricky Van Shelton. Welcome back to McGodwin's Down Home, Down Under. Now, here's my brother Tom to tell you about our very special guest. With a dream in his heart, an old car, and a trusted friend, he left his small town of Grit, Virginia, and headed to Nashville, Tennessee with that real, true grit to make it in the music business. Well, now it's living proof that his Loving Proof album has gone gold, and that he's very successful, and that he did make it in the music business. You know, Tom, some critics have tried to define Ricky's music as uh, in terms such as rockabilly, traditionalist, progressive, the real stuff, honky-tonk, but his voice in music is all a country music lover could ask for. And here's our special guest and also male vocalist of the year, Ricky Van Shelton. Welcome to the show, Ricky. Thank you. Good Appreciate day, it. Ricky. Good day. <laughs> Good day. You said that like Paul Hogan. <laughs> oh, that, well, I, I saw the movie. <laughs> you, you, did you like it? I loved it, yeah. Uh, what does it feel like being voted Male Vocalist of the Year? Well, it's a wonderful feeling. It's, a, it's wonderful to get nominated, you know. It's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to get nominated, and of course it's an honor to win. But I, I don't dwell on, on awards, you know. The only thing I'm concerned with is the fans. How yeah. many tickets can I sell? Because that's the bottom line. That's, you know, that's right. You can win every award every year, and if you can't fill up that concert hall, you've got to eat them awards. <laughs> you know? Well, you seem, to be, you seem to be doing pretty good. Uh, I, I know that you used to be a rock and roll fan. Oh, yeah. And, and tell mm -hmm. us a story how your brother, uh, your older brother, got you into country music. He, he didn't con you, did he? Yeah, he did. He, Man, did. he did with a car. With a like, car. With an old car. Uh, but pretty at the time, good. it wasn't an old car. It was just one year old. It was um, 1960, 64, 65. My brother Ronnie had a. 64 or uh, Ford Fairlane, two-door hardtop with a four-speed. Mm -hmm. I was uh, 14 years old. I liked rock and roll music. I liked the Beatles and the Stones and you know people like that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of soul music, too, like Otis Redden, Percy Sledge, people <laughs> like that. Well, my brother Ronnie, one of his friends, they bought a guitar, and Ronnie bought a mandolin, and they was going to learn to play it, and they loved country music and bluegrass music. And uh, you know, even though I was 14 years old, I'd been playing a guitar for probably eight nine years, something like that, and, you know, I could make 15 or 20 chords, and I could, I could play anything I could sing, put it that way, and um, Ryan wanted me to go with him out on the weekends, and they, they would just go to some of their friends' houses, you know, and sit around the kitchen table and, mm -hmm. and pick a little bit, you know, maybe they'd drink a beer, or a little moonshine, whatever, <laughs> whatever they could get, get their plunk, hands up. Or plunk, as we call it in Australia. Yeah, just plunking on the guitars, you know, they'd play the same song for, for half an hour, you know. And uh, he wanted me to go with him be because I could play the guitar and, and help him learn a little bit, help him play, you know. And I, I said, no, I, I didn't want to go because I don't like no country music, you know. And so finally he said, uh, he kept asking me for a couple of weeks, and finally he said, uh, i tell you what, said, if you'll go with me, I'll let you drive my car. <laughs> and I said, you know, well, maybe I, can, maybe I can do this thing, you know. That was the magic word. That right? was the magic word, you know, because I was, like I said, I was 14 years old. He was a car with a four speed, you know, and, and I didn't have no way to get it to the house on the weekends, no way, uh -huh. you know, so... And besides, my mama thought the sun rose and set on Ronnie. She thought he could do no wrong. So anywhere Ronnie wanted to go, I could go with him, you know, yeah. no matter what. Even, even during the middle of the week, you know, on a school night. <laughs> right. So anyway, I started hanging around with Ronnie. And uh, first thing you know, I fell in love with country music, you know, just... It just happened. Well, well I'm, I'm sure, sure glad we did that you did because uh, let me tell you, uh, when when George Jones recorded that uh, song, "Who's Gonna Fill Our Shoes?" Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, Ricky Van Shelton came along and... Uh, uh, two or three other new ones came along because you ha are really keeping country music alive. But Ricky, Thank I want you. to ask you because this is such a competitive business, and yeah. you know that. Yeah. How did you, how did you, Ricky Van Shelton, handle the fierce 
competition when you, when you uh, came to Nashville? Well, you know, I didn't see any competition in the competitive part of the business. When I came to Nashville, all I saw was, in my mind, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to, uh, a recording contract, I wanted to hear myself on the radio, and I wanted a big buzz, and I wanted to be playing all over the country, you know. So that's all I was thinking about. That was all I was up here, you know. Yeah. And so I started making demo tapes, and I'd go to clubs, and uh, I'd give everybody a demo tape, you know. They were terrible, you know, they were terrible tapes, you know. <laughs> be me and my guitar, and I'd be singing all the different parts, you know, had a little four-track recorder. But I was just trying to meet as many people as I can meet, you know, find out who these people were at the record companies that could do me some good, yeah. and how to get to them, you know. So when, when I'd go to a club, I'd get to know the band, I'd get to know people that came into the clubs, and, you know, every time somebody new come in that looked like um, they were somebody, I, I'd, I'd say, well, who is that? You know, who is that guy? What can he do for me? <laughs> well, you're playing, po yeah. playing politics type of thing, eh? What well, kind of? Doing your own PR? Well, yeah, I was. I mean, I was out there searching every, you know, every night. I was out there looking. I'd go to this club, and I'd go to that club, and I'd get up and sing here, and get up and sing there, and mm -hmm. and uh, a writer's off. When I when I heard this guy was a writer, well, I I just make friends with him real quick, you know. We have to take a break right now, but we'll be right back with the Lagarde Twins down home, down under, with our very special guest, Ricky. Van Shelton. Don't go away. You started recording some of the classic songs yes. that were already hits Years ago. by other artists. Right. Now, who came up with that idea to do that? My producer, Steve Buckingham. Because uh, after I got signed with CBS and uh, Steve and I started working together, Mm -hmm. You know, he said, he told me, he said, you know, your voice would be perfect for some of these old songs, you know. And I said, well, that's great because I love the old, older country music, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of these obscure classics, I love that type of music. And so um, he picked out a few that he thought that would go good with, with, with my voice and my style. And one of them was Life Turned to That Way. Yeah. What uh, a great... Who wrote great that? Book. Who wrote that? Harlan Howard wrote it. Uh -huh. Little Jimmy Dickens cut it in the late 50s and uh, Mel Tillis cut it in uh, the early 60s. You know, Ricky, you can't make it in this business on your own. You had a great supporter when you, when you came to Nashville. I think it was Betty? Betty, my wife, yeah. Okay. And uh, apparently she truly, really believed in you and what you were doing and yeah. supported you. It, well, yeah, she did. She supported me uh, mentally and... and uh, Emotionally? Uh, every way, you know, she supported me. When we moved to Nashville, I didn't have a job. Betty was a personnel manager, so she mm -hmm. made decent money. Well, when, when, when she, got, she got the offer to move to Nashville, it wasn't me that got the offer. Mm -hmm. So when she got the offer to, to move to Nashville to be in personnel, you know, she said, well, should I take it? And I said, well, if you're waiting on me, you're backing up, you know. <laughs> so, so we packed up and kissed everybody goodbye, and we moved to Nashville. <coughs> well, you know, we discussed this thing in length. She says, well, I don't want you to work because you can't do your, your thing if you've got to work. I want you to take care of the house and everything during the day. At nighttime, you go out to the clubs and you meet all these people and you work your way into the business, you know. Just get out there and find these people and somehow go this way and go that way. Just get out there and do it. So that's what we did. I, I was a house husband, you might say. I took care of the house. I cooked. Yeah. I cleaned. Could I did everything. Could, could you do, cook? Oh, I'm a good cook. Well, yeah. you like to cook. I can cook anything. <laughs> now, uh, well, let me see. Here's a thing. You and Betty came, you, were you married then? No. <laughs> you weren't married? No. That's okay. That's okay. But you came here <laughs> and you <laughs> both worked hard at the, at the business, right? Yes, yes. To make it. Mm -hmm. And you succeeded. Yes. Well, let me ask you something. What did you guys do differently than somebody else that comes to Nashville, works just as hard, they're devoted, they're dedicated, and, and after a few years they drive away empty-handed? We met the right people. You really think that is the key? Sure, you've got to meet the right people. You know, timing is important, and you've got to meet the right people. The old saying is, who you know? Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of fact in that saying, is who you know. We met the right people, because it was through Betty again that, that I'm here talking to you, because when Betty took this job here in Nashville, she was working, she hired this lady named, named Linda Thompson. Linda is the wife of Jerry Thompson. Jerry is a columnist, a newspaper columnist at the Tennessee in the, the uh, newspaper here mm -hmm. in town. Well, Jerry knows everybody in the world, you know. Yeah. And everybody knows him. He knew Rick Blackburn at CBS, uh -huh. which was at the time was in charge of CBS Nashville. Mm -hmm. He knew him, you know. Linda and Betty knew each other. So through that relationship, I got to know Jerry. 
and we became friends. But I think that's great, Ricky, but I think a, a lot has to do with your talent, too, the, the, well, the fiber and the quality of your voice. I mean, they could have liked you, sure. but you know, uh, you have a, well, a, a very tender, very, I don't know, it's a, a very emotional, you record well. And well, I, well you. you know, it's, a, the, the, it's living proof that your Loving Proof album has gone gold, you know. And uh, so you had, you had to have something that they liked because, you know, you can, have, you can know this person and that person. If they don't like, if they didn't like Ricky Van Sheldon, if they didn't like what they were hearing, if they I'm didn't sure. think they could make money, money with you, with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I realize I'm a product. You know, I told someone the other day. You know, that's good, I, I, I'm a product. You that's know, that's it. That's it's you, business. Right. There's no no friendship. You know, there's friendship and there's business. You know, with, with CBS and myself, the CBS and I'm their product. You know, and that's I know right. that. Uh -huh. I'm friends with CBS with the people there at CBS. You mm -hmm. know, with those people. But when it comes down to business. You know, we, I conduct myself in that manner. You, you got have to a business sell. manager? You have a business manager? Oh, I got all kinds of managers. You do? <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah, I have a personal manager, and I got a business manager, and I got accountants and lawyers and, and booking agents, and uh, I got all kinds of people. Now, uh, you know, you look so young, and you are young, really. I mean, but it, you've you. been in the business for 20 years, right? <laughs> well, you know, uh, not professionally. I've been in the business since 86 professionally, but I've been in this business all my life. I mean, this is all I've ever wanted to do. It's all I've ever done. Uh, you know, I never had a real good job because I was always making myself available to play music. Mm -hmm. While the other kids were playing ball, I was playing the guitar and singing. You know, uh, they were going in high school. The, the kids were going to the dances, uh, the junior senior prom, for example. Uh, I was going there with my brother picking bluegrass and country way back in a stick somewhere. You know, I was always playing. I used to carry my guitar on my trunk when I got out of school and had a car and a job. Mm -hmm. I carried my guitar everywhere I went. I'd carry it to work. You know, I, carried, I was always playing. Ricky, w when you go out uh, with the out by yourself or friends, you know, and you walk into a restaurant, does it bother you when people come up and say, hey, can we have your autograph? And we knew you when you were back then and you were starting in the business. And, and does that, that bother you? Well, uh, yes and no. It, doesn't, it, it does bother me sometimes. I, I, I'm, you know, when you get busy in yeah. this business, you're busy, you know, and I got so much time to eat and so much time to do this, so much time to do that. So it bothers me that I, that, that I don't have time to, to deal with these people. Not that you, might, you don't mind doing no, it. No, I don't mind doing it. It's just the time factor oh, that I don't have time. And that's what's hard about it because you, you can't say, no, I, I'm sorry, you know, get away from me. It's not that at all. It's just that you're in a hurry. So what you have to do is you just do the best you can. You know, you sign the autographs mm -hmm. and you be nice and cordial to them and just try to, and you pray that, that they don't think you're a jerk, you know, because yeah. oh. you're trying to get away from them because you've got to go here, you've got to go there. <laughs> Paul Newman made a statement, he said, the last time he ever signed an autograph when a fellow followed him into the restroom one time. <laughs> that was it. He said, Paul, can I have, can I have your autograph? Well, I, 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 I signed an autograph in the bathroom, but I was, I was coming out, you know, so. <laughs> That's great. Well, Ricky, what, what are your ultimate... Uh, say goals or aim in life. You've won Male Vocalist of the Year. Hopefully, you're probably going to drive to get uh, Entertainer of the Year. Well, um, uh, I'm not driving at Entertainer of the Year. I'm, I'm not driving at any of the awards. Like I said, you know, I'm flattered and I'm honored and I truly am and I mm -hmm. mean that. But awards are not important to me and I mean that. The only things important to me is those people out there that come to see me. Yeah. And the records. The quality of music, not the uh, not the, uh, the quantity, but the quality of right. songs that that people hear. That's the only thing's important to me, as far as the music goes. But as far as the goals go, yeah, I want to I want a whole wall full of platinum albums because that'll say that says it all. Yeah, you know. And I and I got my farm. I always wanted a farm. I got me a farm. Where's your, where's, where I want to be farm? happy too. That's that's the main thing. I, I I've always been a happy person. I want to continue to be so. Well, how, how do you find how do you find happiness, Ricky? What if you said, well, you know, happy, happiness is kind of a, you know, a common word, but how do you really, how would you define happiness to say to be really, truly happy? Do you think anyone is truly happy, happy? Well, sure. Yeah. Well, how would you define happiness? Well, <laughs> <Gold records>? well, <laughs> well <laughs> no. Part of it, right? Yeah, well, that's part of it. It takes yeah. a lot of things to make people happy. Now, where's you know? your farm? You have a farm? Where's yeah, your I, have a, I have a farm around Nashville. You know. I ain't gonna tell you exactly where it is. Though. No, no. <laughs> but, but do you have horses on it? Uh, no, I have, I have, uh, I have cattle. I have beefalo cattle. Mm -hmm. Beefalo is a cross between a buffalo and a beef cattle. Mm -hmm. Oh. And the benefits of the beefalo is uh, the cholesterol content is very low and the fat content is very low. 
and the meat is, tastes just like a regular nice steak, you know. Yeah. But uh, like we I said, lo- well, you know, we eat, we eat a lot of steaks in Australia. I, I, I'm a steak eater. I love meat and potatoes. Because you know, Australia is the second largest beef producing country next to Argentina, so we raise a lot of cattle down there. Plus, would you, would sheep. you like to uh, would you like to come to Australia? Sure, I'd like to come to Australia. What a great classic one-on-one interview with Ted and Tom, the Lagarde twins. I want to tell you about their book, The Lagarde Twins, Showbiz Hustlers. Let me take you back to the beginning. These twin boys walk 15 miles across the bushlands of Australia to a tent with a dirt floor and folding chairs. As the projector started up, the movie appeared in black and white on the screen. And there, for the first time, they saw Hopalong Cassidy. They ran almost all the way home and told their mom, we're going to become cowboy singers. Let me read the introduction to Showbiz Hustlers. Being raised in the bushlands of Australia in the 1930s and 40s was a rough and hard life. We didn't think about it back then because that's how life was. You have to live the hard life to understand it. But we also made a picture in our minds of the kind of life we wanted to lead, and it became a beacon that has guided us on our long journey in show business. We hope and pray that our book falls into the hands of our fellow strugglers and dreamers to give them unfailing encouragement to pursue their hopes and dreams. Above all else, we want to give God all the praise and glory for our long lives and for His mercy and grace in dealing with us throughout the years. So grab the reins and ride over one million miles with us from the bushlands of Australia across seven continents through 23 countries and 45 of the 50 states in America. Let's ride. Ted and Tom Lagarde. They appeared in Vegas, movies and TV shows. And for you Trekkies out there, get this. This book is packed with pictures and stories and is a must read. We'll put a link below the video so you can get your copy of The Lagarde Twins Showbiz Hustlers. The Lagarde Twins Showbiz Hustlers makes a great gift. This book is about twin brothers from Australia who had a dream, and it came true. This is Gary Beatty, and as Ted and Tom Lagarde would say, G'day, mate.